inside for Victoria. Betsy says Gaim would secure that. Peter Dacos was born in 1961 to Phyllis and Stan Dacos, who had arrived in Australia from Macedonia in the 50s. At that stage of his life, his parents could never have dreamt that their young son, who started kicking a ball around the Fitzroy Primary School, would one day go on and become one of the most skilled and loved players to play in the Australian Football League. He's short. Then elects to kick it to the half-forward line, Dacos and Eppleston. Clever mark by Dacos with the one hand. Onto the left foot, Francis. To the goal square, Christian. Dacos loves these and he kicks it. It's an avalanche. Good block by Harding. Dacos, always dangerous. Snapshot is brilliant for a goal. Turn out to Dacos. Beautifully picked up. He puts it on the ground. Terrific skill shown by Dacos. Like many stars of the past with European origins, Dacos's family knew far more about soccer until one day when his father Stan went to see the South Melbourne Hellas team play and heard the roar of the crowd at the Lake Oval and finished the day watching South Melbourne Football Club, the Australian rules team. We went to a football game and in the end, uh, you know, continuously uh, went to football, but Soccer's never been a, a question in our family, uh, never come up, whether it be you know, for soccer or football. Football's always been number one. And it was the Lake Oval where you got a bit of a love for the game too, wasn't it? Well, it certainly was. Ed, uh, uh, we were there every week. Uh, a, a lot of, we went, even went out to Geelong, which was, we used to look at as a, a bit of a uh, hike for us, but uh, we got out to every game. There was never a, a Saturday we'd miss. I'd finish my uh, local games with, with Preston RSL and uh, you know, we'd be all in the car the younger brother, dad, and uncle, and uh, straight to the footy. It seems so long ago now that one of Collingwood's most famous sons actually hated the black and white as a kid. But even early on, his mother Phyllis remembers her son could not get enough of the game. He used to kick all day and night, all the toilet paper, his socks, and everything. I used to say, shame yourself, Peter. He never stopped. Always he jumped, he made trouble. Mom. Not even after joining Collingwood did Peter's love of the red and white diminish, according to his father, Stan. When he finished the seconds, I'd get in the car, go to South Melbourne or Essendon or wherever South Melbourne was playing. We used to go out there and watch it. How are you going to kill us? <laughs> Eventually, in 1977, Peter Dacos had caught the eye of recruiting staff for his play for the Preston RSL side, and he was invited down to Victoria Park. But even then, Dacos was a reluctant magpie. I was recruited to Collingwood. Uh, I was asked down in, in the start of uh, 77, and I sort of declined. Like a lot of young kids, playing with your junior club, you, you've got your mates, and you and you probably uh, don't want to lose that more than anything. That's possibly why a lot of other footballers, you know, haven't made the grade because, you know, sticking with mates, I suppose. Um, but I was asked down in 77. I, I didn't go down until one of my other mates was asked down later in the year. We came down halfway through the year. Um, we were still playing with the under-16, our under-16 competition with Preston RSL, and I came down only because a mate had come down. It was never, uh, I never ever thought I was good enough to make it, but um, what the hell, it was something to brag about, I suppose, being invited down to Collingwood. But uh, we got down here, and by the end of the year, we'd, our um, clearance had come through, and we, we played the last six games of the year. It must have been a very heady period for you as a young kid coming down here and seeing such great names that were playing around that time and, uh, and playing with such big, big name uh, players, having seen them play as a kid. Oh, certainly. Uh, I actually, because I lived in Fitzroy and we you know, weren't far away, I, I used to come down to training now and then and uh, the place has changed a lot, uh, you know, even in the room where we're in now, um, which is adjacent to the offices, it used to be a lot bigger. They used to have a couple of pool tables in there. I remember coming in here and watching the players, um, you know, having playing pool before uh, practice and things like that and uh, I mean it was all a dream it's, you know a lot of the, the, the heroes back then uh, you know you had Peter McKenna, Len, Len Thompson, you know Shorey you know you had all the uh, the big names of football which uh, even though I was sort of I couldn't identify with them because I was a, still a South Melbourne supporter uh, you know they were pretty much uh, football heroes to me. But Collingwood had seen enough, and while young Dacos was keeping his head down, the good judges knew they had a live one. 
Former Collingwood champion and reserves and under-19 coach Ron Richards went on to be chairman of selectors for the victorious Collingwood 1990 Premiership side. And no wonder, for he, more than anyone at the club at that time, saw what the youngster from Preston possessed. I'd have to say Ronnie Richards really helped me out um, in my early years. Uh, it's hard when you come down to a club such as Collingwood um, because there's so many, so many guys that come down to Collingwood. I mean, it is the premier club in the sense of, uh, you know, having the support and uh, you know, membership and, and all that. And, and, you know, everyone aspires, I think, to, uh, to play with a league club, no doubt, and especially play with a club such as Collingwood. And uh, uh, when I first come down, I, you know, when I started to progress and play well in the, in the under nineteen and did come up, Ronnie Richards, um, you know, was the one that took me under wing, and I suppose oh, I had a foot in the door there because when the coach of the reserve side takes you under his, his wing, you're sort of you know, you're, you're halfway home, I suppose, because as I said, it, it's hard enough for a lot of players to come in not being known. There's probably possibly 60, 70 players down here training, and players coming through, so a lot of kids don't get noticed noticed as much and I was probably fortunate uh, Ronnie took me under his wing and really pushed for me and actually even set up uh, for me to win one of the awards when I did eventually play a, a senior game it was through his, through his uh, famous brother Lou and uh, uh, I ended up winning the award on uh, World of Sport it was only because Ronnie had teed it up with Louis so uh, you know he, he helped me tremendously and he was always there you know with uh, you know, encouragement and to push me along and uh, when things got a little bit hard, he, uh, he was always there. So with Ron Richards on side of the club and Lou Richards on side in the media, there was not much else to do for Dacos than to go out and live up to their expectations. Peter Dacos believes his family's influence and the hard-working example set by his parents stood him in good stead at this point of his career. Family kept the low key, you know, with the whole thing. Um, you know, they don't sort of go around. Dad's pretty quiet, you know, he'd be sitting in boxes and, and only now people around him are starting to know through other people that he's my father, people in the box, because he says nothing. BT used to be his uh, hero and uh, Gavin Brown and Darren Mullane, so, you know, he, uh, I mean, he sort of, I say to a lot of people, what's he like when, you know, if I kick goal, whatever, and they say, does nothing, he might have a smile or, you know, but he doesn't really say a lot, and that's, that's like the way I've been brought up, and uh, I don't really like it in, in people, you know, I like the low-key approach, and, uh, you know, I would never be that way myself, so, um, it was great, I mean, I think things like that, uh, no doubt the family's wrapped and you, and you keep within the family, but uh, I was never one to sort of be wearing me Collingwood jumper out in the streets or running with it or, you know, going you know, to a disco with me laser or something. But but football, as legendary Hawthorne and St Kilda coach Alan Jean says, has more downs than ups. And Dacos was soon to find out the low side of the game. Injury struck. First with a string of knee injuries, the worst resulting in a knee reconstruction. Then another, a mystery foot problem that, unlike many of his opponents, looks set to put him out of the game. I was pretty devastated. I'd had other knee operations, and um, but nothing of, of that, uh, you know, uh, seriousness, I suppose. And uh, 
having done, and then I suppose it gave me a time to really think about my football um, and think, I suppose, what was what was ahead of me. And, and there was a lot of worry because uh, the worry, I suppose, I've never been quick, and, and I suppose it was always in the back of my mind that I was going to lose that little bit of pace that I I had kept and, and, and my game is, is twisting and turning and I just, I was, you know, uh, I just didn't know whether I'd have that, that flexibility, I suppose, that movement and uh, I, worked, I worked very hard, you know, I was doing physio um, every day for eight weeks um, when I, uh, after I heard it and um, I ended up coming back. Uh, I remember within about eight months I could have played football uh, but John kept me back because the, the graft itself still hadn't mended properly and it takes right up until 10 months and then the next two months uh, of a knee reconstruction at, at that stage back in 85, um, you know, you have to wait the extra two months just to be on the safe side, whereas nowadays, I mean, knee reconstruction is uh, seven, eight months as Richard Osborne has sort of proved, but the, uh, the opinion was that, uh, you know, my feet were in a bad way, I had stress fractures and then because I'd had the stress fractures on the outside of my foot, I started walking on the inside to take the weight off and unfortunately, under the arches you've got a tendon called the plantar fascia tendon. Well, I'd snapped one clean off the bone and the other one was pretty badly inflamed and uh, that's why it wasn't um, healing. And uh, unfortunately, when you've got an injury such as that and you're, uh, even, I mean, I, I, I had four days in bed trying to get over it, but unfortunately what I kept doing was I'd, you'd get up in the morning and have a shower, so you'd be aggravating the injury, you'd be walking on it. It's like having a shoulder first thing they do is put it in a sling and, and mobilise it and after three weeks it's as good as gold. Um, unfortunately we couldn't immobilise the bottom of my feet. Every time I, I walked, you know, five feet to get to the kitchen sink I was aggravating the injury so it wasn't healing. And um, in the end, uh, you know, Lee, I, I tried to play at the start of the year uh, with no training and, um, you know, it wasn't the go as I said earlier. You know, the way the clubs come on nowadays, you know, uh, you know, everyone's on an equal par and it doesn't matter what you'd done the year before, the years prior. I mean, it was what was ahead of us and um, Lee gave me the chance to come up but unfortunately I couldn't train through the week. It wasn't fair to the other boys that had put the work in. So it was up to me to get myself right. They let me go away, get myself right and, you know, if I did come right, you know, back in. Dacos fought back after that with a renewed hunger for the game. It was a hard time. Um, no injury is, is good in football, and you know you, when you miss a week, especially in my position. I mean, I, when I miss weeks, I, I really hurt. And uh, to be honest, I'd rather stay away from the football. That's how much it hurts me. And uh, to be not out there, but to, to to miss a whole year was pretty devastating. But at the same time, I believe it, it made me a better player because uh, I think it was something um, that I nearly lost. I nearly lost my football, I suppose, and lost my career and uh, made me grateful, you know, for it when I did come back. So I worked pretty hard when I did come back and, um, and I suppose uh, have followed on since then. It was at the time that Dacos was undergoing various treatments for his injured feet that his spirit plummeted to an all-time low. It was reported that the club had had enough, that unless he came good, they would slash his contract. Even worse was the feeling that Dacos was looking for a way out of Victoria Park. The question of not wanting to play was, is absolutely ludicrous because uh, I love love football and love the club so much that that was never in any question whether I wanted to play and um, it was a hard time. I, I ended up uh, playing the last half of the year. The feet did settle down a little bit but um, I ended up playing the second half which was nine games and at the end of the year it was decided that um, I'd um, go into hospital and I, that's when I was opened up and, uh, you know, the tendon was snapped off and that was repaired. And then spending five days completely uh, in bed without getting on my feet actually helped the other foot. And, um, and that was basically what helped me. I, I sort of get, they, they do hurt me now and then, but um, nowhere near, you know, what I was going through earlier. It was just pretty excruciating and I'd put it down to, it was worse than having the knee reconstruction. With the pain in his feet and his heart overcome, Dacos was again free to do what he does best and that is play football.
the ground take off and don't they love it their champion scores like Pelé Naley oh well played Mark Naley but Dacos got in from behind Taylor at the back with a set Dacos great play at the back is right quickly to Dacos he pulls it back and he has put it through towards half forward now this is the brilliant Dacos with a quick kick I think he might have put it through Peter Dacos. He has. Drop punt to the goal square. Dacos and Blackwell. Dacos. Kicked by Gaper. Nearly marked there by Starcevich. Picked up by Dacos. It'll roll through. It's a goal. Charges it a little one. Dacos. 23 kicks for Guan. Dacos. Oh, strength. Strength and the use of the body. Well done, Peter Dacos. He's a great effort. The skill is unbelievable. Like, just a little bit of magic in weave there. And then sets sail and drills it through. While his individual exploits were causing even the most fanatical supporter to look for new superlatives, the whole reason for playing, team success, continued to elude Dacos and football's most demanding and famous club. After playing in a losing under-19 side in 1978, a losing reserves team in 1979, and then defeated senior sides in 1980 and 81, Dacos honestly thought that his chances of playing in a premiership were gone. Finals failures in 1984 and in 88 and 89 did nothing to help his anxiety and it became worse after Collingwood's first final of 1990, the now famous draw in the qualifying final against the West Coast Eagles. The feeling was good, the feeling was great uh, with the boys and unfortunately we, we didn't get up in that, in that game against the Eagles. I mean, I, I suppose you can't throw stuff like the media stuff um, out. I mean, it's in the back of your mind and, and no doubt crops up now and then. Um, I personally um, never believed that there was a thing such as Collywells. I just felt in the past that we just lacked, you know, the, the, the two players, two or three players necessary to take us through the finals. Um, a lot of the early finals uh, games we did play, especially in the early 80s as well, I, I just found when I was down here that we were, and nothing against the boys, you know, a great bunch of guys, and, um, but unfortunately we were really slapped together. We, we brought a lot of boys from other clubs and um, not really big names, but we were slapped together. Tommy Hafey really did a great job getting us to where he did with the players. Um, but unfortunately, when you play finals football, again, that's a step up on, on normal Saturday football. And um, we just didn't have the players able to combat uh, the other sides and, and to sort of take the game by the scruff of the neck in finals. And um, Later on, uh, when we get to the uh, late 80s, again, I just felt we were probably two couple of players off being a really, really good side or being in the top three. We acquired these players and um, we had a, a pretty good run in 1990 and then uh, ended up being hammered by Hawthorne in round 20. We won the next two games well. And then having drawn that, that game against the Eagles, I remember being really disappointed because you go into every game pretty confident. I was pretty confident we could get over the Eagles. I felt it was a game we really didn't play that well in. I remember thinking straight after the game that they had really played, I felt, the best that they, they could play uh, on, a, on a Saturday. And um, I felt that we had players down and um, maybe a little bit nervous at the same time. And, um, but I felt that there was a lot of improvement. And I, I knew uh, without sort of letting everyone know, I, I knew that the second game was going to be a moral. I just felt that uh, we couldn't play. I, I knew we could go up a, another cog. If there is one thing people will always remember Peter Dacos for, it is his uncanny ability to find the goals from any angle. And in the match against the Eagles, Dacos invented a new kick, which ultimately kept Collingwood in the game. Not wasting any time getting the ball moving. Great bump by Darren Malay. In comes Brown. Collingwood lifting. Ground right on the boundary line. Back to the lane, likewise. Dacos nearly runs out of room. 
I could sort of see it evolving that, that the ball was going to end up uh, no doubt over the heads and uh, Guy McKenna sort of made a, a half you know, half a lunge at, at Rowdy, went around him so it was really basically Johnny Worth's fault, ball went over his head and uh, I remember getting it and, and sort of I was in the pocket so there wasn't a lot, I couldn't really centre it, I was only about 15 yards out so there, there wasn't a lot, I didn't really have the time to have a look anyway and uh, I decided to have a shot and, and a lot of people said to me, because I was on the wrong side, they, they've said, why did you kick it with your right foot? Well, I kicked it with my right foot because it opens up the angle. Had I kicked on the left foot, I would have been right on the boundary, but kicking it with my right foot, it gives me that extra two, three feet and, um, you know, opens up the goals a little bit. It might sound a bit strange, but I knew I had to get the ball as close to the line to bounce in because I was kicking a, a check side that was going to, was spinning away from goal. It had to, had to either bounce on the line or go just over the line. Saker nearly runs out of room. Oh. He's goal! Magnificent goal. Peter Draker, the champ, 13-12, the 12-10. Fortunately enough, uh, after I kicked it, it, it ended up just over the line. So, you know, it was just one of those things that people have said to me, you know, how do you do it? But uh, I think that uh, with goal kicking, I think that if you, you can kick to the target, um, you know, that's all I hope to do. I kick for the target. You know, and I, if I kick for the target, unfortunately, uh, you know, if it doesn't go in, well, I feel I've done the job, you know. And it, it's just a freak goal. From the boundary, I mean, I could try that five times, I'd probably never kick it again. It's just one of those things. And uh, fortunately, we've had our bad luck in games, and fortunately, we've probably uh, there's a bit of a turnaround for us. Take off. Nearly runs out of room. Oh. He's gone. It might make sense to him, but not even his father has any idea how his son does it. No answer for it. And nobody knows. That's his nature. He's training, he's training, he's kicking. In 1990, with a whole new battalion of on-ball players, Dacos was moved to the forward pocket, where he finished the season second on the goal-kicking list with 97 goals. Something he believes is just part of the job that Lee Matthews gives him. In they go up in front of the Collingwood goal. They wouldn't want to let Dacos get it. They do. Peter Dacos on the left foot. My job was to kick goals and, um, you know, I had to do it. If I, unfortunately, if, if I didn't, I would have lost my place in the side. And uh, it's just when I go out there, I, I have to kick goals. For, for Peter Dacos to get 20 kicks, I haven't really done my job. I mean, I've got to kick four goals and, uh, you know, I've had, I've had a, a fair, you know, good day or whatever. And, uh, and that's how people look at me nowadays and the pressure's on me and I'm pretty, pretty switched on to try and do the job. And, uh, but when I go out, I just basically try and know where the goals are at all times. Uh, a bit of a look over the shoulder now and then, just so that I know where I'm positioned, so that if I get the ball, you know, I know basically where the goals are without even looking. Floating it up towards full forward. Alvin couldn't take it. Chance for Dacos. Shoot and goal. What a start. He'll do something magical. Yes, out to the right, hook it back as he put it through. Yes, it's a goal to the Magpies. But is there a secret? People have often asked me how, how I do, you know, how, how I've kicked them. And actually, uh, my mother-in-law said to me, you know, she bets I put, I put my boots on the wrong way, you know. So <laughs> that might be one, one little thing. These days, when Dacos has a set shot from 50 metres, Collingwood fans immediately start calling for one of his booming torpedoes, of which Dacos is one of the last great exponents. He might try a torpedo here, he does, and thumps it, look at that, it's home! Lee has said to me, look, you know, you run, you, you run the show when you get the ball. If you think you can kick the goal, you have a shot. And the same with Torp, he doesn't really like a lot of guys kicking Torp, because I suppose at times they can be difficult. And um, but he has said, look, you know, back yourself in. If you think you can, you can kick the goal. Um, you know, you go for it. I, you know, I think that uh, especially early in the year, I kicked a few. So I suppose that's why he gave me that bit of a rein. Whereas if you if you had to reverse that, had I kicked a few mongrels, well, he, again, he probably would have uh, put a stop to it. Uh, 
no doubt. Jacob takes the free, 75 metres. Oh, oh, mighty torpedo! He's goal! Now, the crowd will await. Yes, he is going to torpedo punt. Have a look at it. A brilliant kick by Dacos. A 65 <laughs> metre kick right through the middle. With the torp, uh, when, I'm, when I'm about the 50, you could sort of back it in. That the, if there's no other options or no one's clear, that I'll, that I'll go back and kick a torp. And uh, you know, I'm pretty comfortable kicking him as well. Have you ever passed inside 50? Yes. <laughs> See, Dougie Bailey keeps asking that. He sort of just, he just uh, puts his head down, doesn't even bother leading. One of the great things about football is the friendships and the fun times that players take away from the game. And that has been just as big a part of the Dacos career than the freak snap goal from the boundary line. One such incident of the lighter side of football occurred when at the toss of the coin at the start of a game, Dacos and former teammate Greg Phillips would bet on the outcome. Greg Phillips and I, we used to huddle with a lot of the, uh, no doubt, back in them days, they allowed the whole side to go into the centre of the ground. This was going about, about five, six years ago. And uh, I remember there was uh, one game there... Um, we were playing uh, Hawthorne, I think, and uh, I remember Tucky and um, Mark Williams were in the middle of the ground and it was that wave with tossing the coin and Tucky won the toss. And I remember, you know, I started yelling, yeah, and I was <laughs> jumping up and down because I'd won the bet off thing. I remember the Hawthorne players looking at me pretty horrified, you know, Tucky had won the bet near and I jumping up and down, but it went, and I'd won $20 off Greg Phillips. So we had an on-field thing and actually I think the flipper owes me bomb out of that too. While a Dacos practical joke could have gone horribly wrong for skipper Tony Shaw. Some guys uh, cutting holes in your underpants and things like that sort of, sort of norm and hiding your gear and uh, you know dropping stuff in your lockers but uh, stuff we can't mention. I mean sure he uh, unfortunately a couple of times went away on trips and ended up with uh, the boys bought a couple of pairs of ladies undies and put them in his bag so Debbie was pretty horrified when he got home opened up his laundry to clean all his gear and there's these two pairs of ladies undies there but you know a lot's going on and um, you know uh, it's been fantastic all the memories are great and I suppose as I said earlier that's what the team sport is all about you know uh, sharing the ups and downs and uh, you certainly take away a lot of good memories. After 13 years of football Dacos was again facing the ultimate a shot at the grand final. Collingwood, after the draw with the West Coast Eagles, came out and in successive weeks easily accounted for the Eagles and then for Essendon in the second semi-final to assure themselves a position in the 1990 Grand Final, the first under the banner of the Australian Football League. I knew we were going to put on a good show just by the, the attitude of the players after the first Essendon game, the second semi. That you know, once we were coming off the ground, especially in the rooms, it was pretty low key. Uh, we knew we had one game to go. Uh, and no one was really getting carried away, so that was a really good sign, and or excellent sign as far as I was concerned. So the feet were, were still planted firmly on the ground, and um, you know the guys knew we had one more you know engagement uh, to get over the top of, and uh, and the most important game of our lives. Going into that game, the, the training was pretty good. Uh, no doubt we had the the week off with the prelim, and we did our normal training, and that was one good thing. Lee. Going into the finals never changed our, our workload or, and he never ever changed basically his direction of, um, of training. Um, uh, right from the first home and away game right through to the week, the grand final training never ever changed. And uh, I suppose that keeps the players, you know, uh, I suppose the, the nerves out a little bit because uh, actually when you get big events and whatever, you know, you, you tend to change your, your style or you change things you do, but you should never ever think you should do whatever comes natural and, and comfortable. And that was good. He kept the low, uh, the hat, the lid on that, I suppose, and kept players down a bit. And um, things didn't change for as far as we're concerned. The Magpie Army was certainly out, and that helped the team's preparation, according to Dacos. No doubt we had the crowds out here. Um, and that was fantastic. But despite all the reassuring words that Coach Lee Matthews could give, the tension and the stakes were mounting, even for a seasoned campaigner like Dacos. Going into the game, it was pretty low key. Uh, there was no, I remember being pretty worried myself. I, I think, unfortunately, Lee said, forget about this Collie Wobble, don't worry about uh, losing the game. But at the back of my mind, I was thinking, geez, on the other side of the coin, I was thinking, hell, if we lose this, you know, I, I was actually thinking of giving it away. I mean, it would have really killed me. And I know a few of the other boys felt the same way. And, I was a little bit worried in the back of my mind I was worried we'd lose but at the same time I, I knew we were a really big chance because the attitude was fantastic. Everyone was pushing each other um, and even the boys that knew they were going to miss out were pushing pushing the senior guys. So it was an, an all-in effort 
which you need and which maybe was lacking in the past for us. So to the big day. All the preparations were over. 32 years of heartbreak, of which Dacos had been a part for 13, had come to one sunny afternoon in October. And unlike past grand finals, when Collingwood had whipped themselves into fever pitch, this time coach Lee Matthews had aimed his team the other way. And even before the game had started, Collingwood had grabbed the psychological advantage away from their opponents, Essendon. Got to the ground, I remember getting to the ground, and, and the feeling was great. And I remember walking into the rooms, that, and the first thing that stuck out in my mind, our place wasn't dressed up. Uh, you know, Collingwood rooms, uh, in years gone by, was all decorated and, and uh, jazzed up, and, and it looked more like a fair and a party atmosphere. And, and certainly, uh, you know, the party for us, was going to be at 8 o'clock that night had we have won and um, the players knew this. I remember looking into the Essendon rooms because I went down onto the ground to have a look and coming back I looked into the Essendon rooms and just to see how they were going about things I remember looking and they were just had a sea of streamers and and uh, I remember saying to myself good you know um, as far as I was concerned our party hadn't sort of begun and, and going into the rooms the feeling was good you, I knew by just you know by just looking at players faces that they're turned on uh, their minds were on the job. There wasn't a hell of a lot of talk, especially uh, prior to Lee's talk, at, uh, which was at one o'clock, oh, sorry, uh, quarter past one. There wasn't a lot of talk. Players were trying to get themselves into the, the, the game mode and uh, having a m meeting with Lee. Lee said to us, look, you know, it's going to go for 120 minutes. You know, go out, take it all in, enjoy yourself, you know, but no doubt win. The game started with Collingwood wasting opportunities up forward and Essendon's Paul Salmon worrying the Magpies. It wasn't until late in the first quarter that Collingwood finally broke through for their opening goal. It was a miracle goal and guess who produced the magic? No one can break clear. It's kept to the advantage of Dacos. Look at the gather. The right foot is back. And I remember um, heading towards the ball. I knew I was a chance to get it and I remember Kranzberg being right there. I was going to get to the ball just before him and I knew had I have grabbed it that uh, no doubt he would have tackled me and I would have lost the ball. If I hold the ball, the ball would have dribbled out of my hands and, and away. So I tried to play the ball away, um, away from, from, from him and uh, not take possession, hoping that maybe he'd grab me and give me a hold of the man. Basically, that was probably going through his mind as well. He knew I didn't have the ball, he didn't grab me let me virtually go, go across his body. I went towards the boundary line and uh, found a bit of room to straighten up and head towards goal. And as I said earlier, I mean, I knew where the goals were, kicked towards them. And uh, fortunately, uh, as I said earlier, a bit of luck went our way this time and the uh, ball went through. That goal happened in a split second. Yet so much had flashed through Dacos's brilliant football brain. And this is why Dacos is so good. His instincts, balance and level-headedness all culminate together in one movement. And while no one else knows what he's going to do next, Dacos is in total control and doesn't know what all the fuss is after the deed is done. And so it was with his second goal of the match. Heads in towards the pocket. Over the head of Thompson it goes. Dacos, this is where he's at his best. The master. That is all it takes. Well, that's his second goal. Was a miraculous goal, and that was miraculous as well. Now watch this. Here he is behind Thompson. He picks it up. Now it's on his right foot. Ball was heading out. Uh, took a bad bounce. Went over Bomber Thompson's head, um, and uh, I found myself with the ball. Uh, lost Bomber Thompson. Shrugged him off, and um, and basically was running in the goal. And I couldn't really give it a rowdy. I was running in the goal. Terry Danaher wouldn't come out, and. By this time, I'd run pretty close in the goal, so well, the only option was to, to try and dart in and kick a left foot, but um, players were coming in, so you know, I moved, I think, a step out to the left and, and kicked a boomerang and you know, a little bit of luck. Dacos, this is where he's at his best. His two goals, two of the most memorable moments in one of the great historic grand finals. One of the other memories was the vicious quarter-time brawl that saw Collingwood full forward Gavin Brown flattened by Terry Danaher but that was one incident that Dacos had very little to do with. You know, I was down the other end and actually as soon as I saw when I sort of had my head down and I sort of was, was walking towards where I knew we'd be uh, huddled uh, in front of the members and I got to about centre forward and realised the fire was going and I stood there and watched and thought it was going to die down 
and then sort of uh, fired up again. By the time I got there, it had sort of all thing, and I remember looking down and, and seeing uh, Rowdy. I, I couldn't tell who it was, and then seeing R Rowdy, I was pretty horrified, uh, to, uh, you know, having lost him especially, uh, because he's, he's certainly a, a big key on our forward line and such a great player that uh, I thought, oh, no, you know, this is typical of, of you know, the bad luck for Collingwood. And, um, uh, and straight away I thought, geez, what are we going to do now? And I remember walking back and the players were no doubt pretty fired up and uh, there was still a lot of pushing and shoving and uh, getting, getting back to the huddle, I remember we, we to myself, geez, I hope we've just got to settle down and forget about that because the thing I was worrying about was we were going to start you know, going the man sort of thing. And I remember Lee coming out and um, sort of he was pretty calm about the whole situation. He, he just said, look, we've got to play the ball, forget about it, boys. You know, there's too much at stake. Earlier in the week, Collingwood had watched highlights of the 1989 Grand Final, which Hawthorne won, and Geelong had lost mainly by playing the man instead of the ball early in the game. And Collingwood were conscious after the quarter-time fracas not to get sucked into forgetting what they were really there for. Character was shown in the fellas there that, uh, you know, the head went down again and, and, and they worked towards, um, you know, sort of consolidating and getting themselves right in the game. Two and a half minutes left. Monkhurst from 40 metres out. The kick looks pretty good. Up go the fans. It's another goal. Well, as I mentioned, that's his third goal. Damien Monkhurst. Most improved player last year. You can see there Lee Matthews coming down. He realises the team have won. Smile on his face. And he is a very happy man. Finally, it was all coming together, and late in the game, Dacos decided it was time to soak in the atmosphere. The match was won. His football lives were complete. He was in the history books as a Collingwood Premiership player. I remember the last quarter, about the 25-minute mark, and I, and when the ball was down the other end, I, people kept calling out and things like that, and and I remember ke I kept turning around. And I was seeing, you know, people were crying and jumping on each other, uh, spilling beer all over each other, popping champagne, and, and it was fantastic. And uh, I remember just waving my fist to a lot of people and uh, trying to sort of get in the, the party spirit, I suppose. I mean, I was pretty, pretty happy and, and wrapped about the whole situation. Geez, I'd give anything to have come off the ground in a shower and gone and, and sort of stood in Bay 13, just or, or in that outer, just for 10 minutes, just to have taken it all in, because it certainly sa sounded great and, and from where I was uh, in the pocket. Darren Mullane can still speed down the flank, and he marks with a broken thumb. He will feel no pain tonight. From the back pocket, this will be probably the last kick. He need not even kick it. The drought is over. Let the celebrations begin. Alan McAllister and Lee Matthews. Tony Shaw. He's seen his brother play and lose grand finals. And now he is the champion. Let's go down onto the ground with Michael Roberts. Absolutely fantastic down here. The feeling is absolutely sensational. All the Collingwood players are around now. And they are happy. Tony Shaw. got mixed up in the emotion down there. Great effort by Watson there, giving embrace of Tony Shaw. And now Tony Shaw is the champion. Where's the champion? Who's that talking about? That's what it's all about. I mean, we kept our head down all year, and uh, and this is what's the event to I mean, it's good luck the boys that take it in now. I mean, it's an unbelievable feeling. Well, I tell Amy Mum at home, I wish you all the best. We did it! After the game at the presentation, one of the loudest roars of the day was saved for Collingwood's Mr. Magic, when he finally was awarded a Premiership medallion. 35, the miracle man, Peter Dacos. Number 42. And after Tony Shaw finally let go of the cup, Dacos made sure that he would lead the lap of honour. I'm 
I'm sure the boys are going to do a lot of other if we can ever get the cup away from Peter Dacos. You right, guys, for the lap of honor. The thing I did say to uh, the boys was when I grabbed it, I said, now now the lap will be done at my pace, which is uh, pretty slow as you could imagine. And uh, we ended up uh, you know, doing a lap. And I, I remember the year before, and years gone by, really being envious of, of uh, premiership sides, you know, running around with a cup. And I, I got to the stage where a mate of mine, you know, said to me that, uh, you know, I think that you're going to miss out in your career of playing a premiership side. And this was about three years ago three, four years ago, and I, and, I, and it didn't hit home until then, and I thought, geez, he might be right, because even as a kid, I, I grew up expecting it to happen. For Dacos, one of the great moments came in the rooms when his wife, Cindy, was there to share the moment. As well, his father, who came into the Collingwood rooms for the first time in Peter's career. I remember my dad coming in, and dad's never, never comes in the rooms, and I said to him, Dad, if we win it, you've got to definitely come into the rooms, and... Uh, and it was great, he'd come in, which was the first time in all my career, as I said, he's sort of always been in the background. I said, if anyone's going to share the moment with me, I want my father to share it with me. And, uh, and he, he came in, and uh, one of the happiest times for me, too, when I put the, the, the medal around his neck, and he was so proud. And Looking for Peter, find Peter, then he gave me the grand final medallion. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> really great, really good, you know. And what of his mother? I never watch him. Why not? Too scared. Too scared. <laughs> I never listen on the radio. Ah, she been when it's finished, time. that's all I want to hear the results. Who wins and who loses. That night at the Southern Cross Hotel, where the official dinner was being held, word was coming back that Collingwood had erupted in scenes of joy unseen since the end of the war in the streets of Melbourne. Scenes that exploded when the team arrived back at Victoria Park. And coming through and just looking at the scenes, I mean, it was very hard getting through the crowd and then getting up onto the stage, looking out at the sea of people, it was just out of this world. I mean, uh, I always sort of, one dream of mine was always being a rock group and I mean, that was the closest thing I've ever sort of experienced to, 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 to being in, in, a, in a group, I suppose. But the scenes were unbelievable and, and I, I sort of can still picture the faces and the guys and, uh, and, and having taken it all in, something that has stayed with me for a long time. I mean, the ultimate in football, it's a team sport, the ultimate is, is to, uh, ultimate accolade is to win a grand final. Individual awards are great, and I think individual awards are something that's shared amongst your family and, you know, yeah, your family and relatives. But, uh, because no one really wants to hear you brag about yourself. And, but something like a grand final is something that everyone takes in as a team sport and everyone gets involved. And it uh, was certainly a moment, uh, it was a fantastic situation. Um, I remember all the players' wives and girlfriends in the rooms, and it was just fantastic. I mean, they've all been a part of it. They've sort of no doubt pushed us along and, and been a part of it. Uh, they've been on the roller coaster ride. The, uh, they've had the ups and downs of football as well, and, and it's only fair that they should have been a part of it. And that's again with with my dad. I mean, that's how I felt. I mean, he'd seen me go through no doubt the injuries, and and he was feeling pretty uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable about it all. They've been very supportive, mum and dad, and and I wanted him to be a part of it. Especially that was the the ultimate high in football, and and I wanted them to share in it. So what does Collingwood mean to Peter Dacos? Well, it certainly is a way of life. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I, I mean, over the years, I've, I've, um, I've no doubt had inquiries, especially in the early 80s, 83, to, to move clubs. Uh, nothing directly to me, but through managers and whatever. But there was never ever any question who, who I wanted to play with and where I wanted to stay. And uh, it certainly is a way of life. The tradition here is unbelievable. It's a fantastic club. The people I've met through Collingwood have just been. Uh, fantastic. And while many believe he is magic, he does have match day superstition. Well, uh, pe people often ask me about running out last and why my jumper's always tucked out. And, and with uh, running out last, I just feel comfortable. I like, I, I'm actually a guy that doesn't like a lot of strapping as well. We've unfortunately, and I, I don't know whether I should say this on camera, but we've got a policy here that every player's got to have his ankle strapped. And I'll probably give myself away here. I don't even know if they realise I don't get them strapped. But uh, I don't. And it's just because I don't like a lot of bandages, but I haven't done a lot of ankle injuries. I think my whole career in, in I'm going into my 15th year, or 14 years of senior football, or 14 years at the club, I've done two ankle injuries. So uh, 
Oh, three. I did one at a local disco too. I <laughs> throw someone like but, but, No uh, strapping on that, yeah. <laughs> But uh, I don't strap. I, I hate strap. The only I get my thumb strapped, but I hate being strapped up. And uh, I, because I like to be pretty, pretty much relaxed, and, and that's why I like my jumper out. And Lee sort of gets into me and said, told, told me to tuck it in. And I sort of halfway down a tunnel. I sort of always throw it out again. I mean, I tuck it in to keep him happy, and then once he goes up the stairs and I go the other way, I, I always throw it out again. So, and running out last, I just feel relaxed. And, and again, Lee at times pushes me to get up there because I'm vice captain to get up with Shuri and, and lead the boys out. But I, you know, I just, I like, you know, there's certain things you go through a game, and that's what I'm comfortable with, and, um, and that's what I like doing. And, while the Dacos family household retains most of Peter's football memories, there is one memento to his career that will never sit in the trophy cabinet. Yeah, the, the tattoo was something that uh, we sort of said that had we have won it, that we were going to get a tattoo. As I said, the close-knit feeling amongst the guys was one in, you know, one in all in. And uh, we just felt that, uh, you know, it was something to remember and, and as I said that's how important winning a grand final is the, the, the feeling and um, the work that has gone into it I mean just makes it such a, a fantastic memory and occasion and and uh, I mean it was something that we decided that we were all going to get a bit of a memento um, that no one really could take away from us it's I mean the memory is there no doubt that we could have got little plaques made up and whatever but somewhere along the line you know lose them, break them, or, or whatever the case may be, but a tattoo certainly is going to be there uh, for a long, long time. And uh, I remember actually being petrified about getting it, in a sense, my I thought my mother's going to absolutely kill me. <laughs> so I thought, there's no way I can get it. And uh, the, I remember partying on the Saturday after the grand final, and, and no one seen me for about three, four days. And I remember the Wednesday morning, we were, uh, Wednesday afternoon we were leaving for London and I hadn't still got my tattoo and I was probably the last of about seven players that hadn't got it and I remember my mum coming in, hadn't seen me, uh, wished me all the best for, for winning the, the, the grand final and everything. I'd spoken her briefly on the phone but she wanted to see me before I went to London so she popped in and I, I thought I'd test her out here so I said to her, uh, I was still in bed actually, and she said what do you got planned before you go and I said well I've got to do a bit of packing and I said and I'm tongue in cheek, I said I'm getting a tattoo. She said, what? I said, Peter, please don't put tattoo. Mom, I'm going to get tattoo. And I said, please, I don't want to see tattoo on your body. You know, I said, oh, fair enough. And I said, actually, the boys are just going to get a little magpie on their leg. She said, yeah. She must have even contemplated getting one of herself. She said, yeah, <laughs> go for it. You know, so I jumped out of bed a million mile an hour. I thought, beauty. Going down there, I was absolutely petrified. I remember going halfway there and thinking, no, I'm not getting it. I'm turning around. And uh, I remember not being able to get around in the traffic. And I thought, I'll go there and I'll have a good think. I'll watch a couple of the other boys go, because Jamie Turner and Craig Sarsovich were also down there at the time. And I thought, I'll have a look at them and I'll see what they're going through. And I might, you know, I can sneak out if I don't want to get it done. So I went down. Jamie Turner was getting done. And, and, the, and the, the horrified look on his face, I thought, geez. But actually, the tattoo ended up all right. So I thought, oh, yeah, why not? You know, all the boys. It, you know, a lot of the boys, boys got it done, so I thought, yeah, great. Peter Dacos has been blessed with amazing natural ability, but it is too easy to just dismiss him that easily. He has had to overcome the knockers, his own doubts, the injuries and above all work to get the most out of his game and this he says is what he would tell any young player coming through and I'd just say to any running kid you've just got to you practice and they say practice makes perfect but it's perfect practice that makes perfect I think it's quality it's certainly quality when you go out there and you've got to really go out there diligently and, and practice your skills and, and listen to what's being said uh, whether it be from your father your coaches your mother you know they're the keys, and uh, I always say that there's um, there's two ways of learning, and that's by by looking and learning, and by listening and learning. And uh, I'd say they're the two keys, and uh, and no doubt then putting it into practice. So after 207 games, 
411 goals, state representation, two Copeland trophies for the club's best and fairest player, and three times as the club's leading goal kicker, the Peter Dacos story is still unfinished. Like all champions, he will not sit back and rest on his laurels. For in 1991, Peter Dacos has followed his own creed and worked harder again. With one goal achieved, he has set new targets, new mountains to climb, and having tasted glory, he wants more. Well, I'd love to win another one, and, and I think that, especially this year, as Lee said, I mean, you've got to set your goals. I mean, you set goals every time you walk out the front door in the morning to go to work. I mean, you set yourself up for the day, and, uh, and that's how you should approach things, I believe. And I, our goal is, I mean, as Lee's pointed out, that, uh, you know, great sides win premierships, but the great, great sides and sides that are remembered are the back-to-back -back because it is different. I mean, the, the uh, lesser number have done it. So that, that's in our goal now. And uh, my preparation, I believe, for the 91 season has been, I believe, the best that I can prepare myself. And um, hopefully, you know, I've got an upkeep now uh, for the year. I've got a standard to try and um, keep and, and achieve and attain, so, you know, I'll be working towards that.